Cool. Uh, so today I'm excited to introduce today's speaker, Adam Watts. As a kid in Mississippi, Adam played with toy airplanes and set things on fire in the backyard. Despite jobs as an alligator biologist and Peace Corps volunteer, he's not found anything more fun than fire and things that fly. And now Adam is a fire ecologist and leader of the fire and environmental research applications team at the US Forest Service Pacific Wildland Fire Sciences Lab in Seattle. Adam has research interests in the fire ecology of peatlands, species responses to fire, climate effects of smoke, and the development of sensors and their use on unmanned aircraft systems for fire science. He earned his undergrad degree at Emory University and master's and PhD at University of Florida. And he spent eight years as a research professor prior to joining the Forest Service last year. Adam continues to look for ways to benefit ecosystems and all species through his work and collaborations. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to you, Adam, and if everyone could give Adam a warm welcome. Hey, thank you so much, Connor. I, I appreciate it. Um, I wanted to uh, I wanted to maybe write something that would at least make me smile uh, before I, I started uh, talking at y'all. I know that we have um, you know still a little while to go in a strange world of, of talking to one another via the glowing rectangle. So I really appreciate all of you who've, who've shown up to hear a stranger talk about something that may or may not be interesting. So. Um, in thinking about what I wanted to, to uh, talk about, what I thought could, could be useful, um, I do spend a lot of time these days talking about uh, big uh, prescribed fire and wildfire research projects. Um, I do have a, a lot of activities related to unmanned aircraft systems. Uh, Dr. Foulet and, and Leo know that well from my recent visit uh, to Flagstaff. But I've, I've also got a few other things that, that have been in my past. And so what I wanted to maybe do is, is kind of honor the moment by getting us a little bit off of, of, of the glowing rectangle interaction and, and maybe traveling a little bit. So um, give me just a moment because it's, it's hard for me sometimes to uh, talk and do anything at the same time. So what I'll do is I'm gonna try and find the, uh, the screen sharing button and get us on to my, my uh, PowerPoint here. Okay, so hopefully, if I've done this correctly, uh, we may be looking at my screen now. Um, Connor, I see you on the top of my little panel. Okay, you're giving me the thumbs up. So, so we might be on the title slide if I'm lucky here. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about a type of fire that you probably don't see very much of in Northern Arizona. Um, smoldering combustion. It doesn't get a lot of the news attention. It's not quite as photogenic, um, but I think it is interesting for a number of different reasons. And so uh, today to kind of give you just a, a little brief summary of, of the things that uh, lie ahead, I've looked a little bit at, with, with a lot of colleagues, I've looked a little bit at some of the aspects of the emissions from peat fires, some of the hydrologic and ecological effects. So um, now let's let's go on a little trip. Um, this is a trip that that occurs back in time and across geography. So where I was when this story began for me was I was a graduate student at the University of Florida. I was doing my PhD in kind of the southern corner of the state up here in the, the upper left. You can see Big Cypress National Preserve, that's, that's where I did my graduate research. My PhD uh, dissertation work occurred there. And a lot of nice things to say about that area, but it is big. Uh, there are a lot of cypress trees there, that's the name. And uh, it is very flat, it's very wet, and it's an area that gets a lot of lightning. So you, you get a lot of potential for fire. And if you look at B, C, and D, those are different, um, different altitudes and different angles looking at the landscape. If you look at B there, that, that brighter green is a pineland mosaic. Um, it's a little bit more tropical looking than a ponderosa pine savanna. But if, uh, if, if you go up to the Coco Nino and you, you see some nice uh, ponderosa pine savannas with some, some nice understory there, um, it's not terribly different in terms of its fire ecology. Frequently burned, 
uh, low relief landscape. What is tremendously different though, are those lumps that you see in C and D. Those are a little, and I mean like a couple of acres, a few hectares, cypress swamps. So it's a landscape mosaic that's got uplands, and I'll, I'll put that in air quotes. The uplands are like maybe a meter or even a few centimeters higher elevation than uh, the surrounding wetlands, or, or you could even look at it the other way around. Uh, the, the wetlands are just a little bit lower than the surrounding uplands. And this varies across, across space as far as like the extent of it. But when I'm walking around doing my PhD, a lot of the time I'm walking in something that looks like this. You can see those beautiful bromeliads on the sides of the cypress trees. And a lot of the time um, I'm walking along and I'm uh, sort of ankle deep to up to my waist in water. Um, and you might've seen in, in the popular news, you know, these last several years, yes, there's a python problem. Yes, there's a boa constrictor problem in South Florida. I didn't see any of those, but I saw plenty of alligators, lots of other snakes and uh, plenty of mosquitoes. So it's, it's not typically the kind of place where you would imagine somebody like me who uh, uses the term fire ecologist to describe myself would, would spend a lot of time. But there's a wet season and there's also a dry season. So from about November until let's say about May, the area gets almost no rain. So what you see underneath that water are the, these, these areas in these cypress swamps of needle cast and just all the bits and pieces of the trees that, that fall and accumulate. And because they're underwater so much of the time, there's very little decomposition. The, the, the water is very stagnant. Remember I said it's super flat. And so when there is standing water, it's really anoxic. There's very low decomposition rates there. So whatever piles up tends to accumulate. And Remember, this is the, the one thing to keep in mind about this wet season, dry season transition, um, you know, sort of like with you, you have with the monsoon, as soon as you get that transition, you get a lot of lightning, but it's not very wet yet. And so that's when the fire season occurs in this part of Florida. And if it's dry enough and if lightning strikes in the right place, all this accumulated, um, if you're a soil scientist, the histic epipedon or the peat layer, uh, can burn away. And so this is what it can look like. So it can go from, you know, a swamp to, uh, to an ash forest pretty quickly. And these, these areas can be pretty deep. So I got, you know, walking around through the seasons, seeing this kind of uh, transition, the hydrologic transition and the, the pyrologic transition, I got pretty interested in, okay, what's, what's going on here? What's the fire ecology of, of these swamps? So I had some opportunities to see some other places where this phenomenon of, of peat combustion occurred. So this is a couple hundred miles north of where I was just talking about, uh, not far from where I lived outside of Gainesville, University of Florida. And this was during a drought uh, when I, I lived there and there was a fire that burned this dried up lake bed. Well, this lake bed had an accumulation of, of muck and that's you know if you're into your peat terms that's kind of similar and so what happened in this particular photo is you had uh you know some uh sustained fire for for a little bit and it got into the soil and you just got this uh this deep consumption of the muck um and i would guess you know this looks like it might be a meter deep so so this really deep combustion of, of the peat soil that all got me interested in smoldering combustion in peats. And um, if, you've, if you've been around fires that include duff consumption or smoldering, you know, you've got this, this kind of acrid odor. You can probably close your eyes and kind of picture the difference between that smell and, and the smell of some nice efficient combustion in pine needles or something like that. But it, it turns out that this phenomenon of of peat combustion and fires and peatlands is really important globally. So I started, uh, and, and this is going back several years again to, to uh, being a, a graduate student, got interested in, in the occurrence of peatlands. So they're not tremendously common in terms of area. They only occupy two or 3% of the terrestrial surface of the earth. Um, 
and they occur mainly uh, either in the high latitudes, you've probably heard about, you know, the peatlands in Siberia or Alaska or Northern Europe, Scandinavia, or in the tropics. Um, I, I feel like uh, it's, it's pretty uh, common to hear about the peatlands of Borneo, for example, or uh, other places in Indonesia or uh, Africa or uh, in, in South America. So the significance is not only in terms of biodiversity, but I'm thinking in terms of carbon. So two or 3% of the Earth's surface, but they store 600 to 700 gigatons of carbon, according to some estimates. That's like a third of the world's terrestrial carbon. So a lot of times you'll hear people in the 3%, one third um, statistic. That's more carbon in peat soils than exists in vegetation on the planet. It's similar to the amount of carbon that is already in the atmosphere. And if you think about, you know, the atmosphere is big, peatlands, tiny fraction of the Earth's surface. It's, it's just a lot in a small area. And, you know, going back a little bit to talking about the, the fire ecology of these ecosystems, um, typically, if, if you've read the paper that I sent out, um, there's a difference in the order of magnitude that I mentioned. I'm, I'm talking specifically in the paper about the little swamps that I work in. Peatlands in general have a very low fire return interval somewhere between you know, hundreds to thousands of years. And um, you know, normally their combustion is limited by the fact that they are wet. That's, that's one of their defining characteristics but under the right conditions. And they can be surprisingly wet when they do smolder because they sit there and they, they uh, retain that heat. This, uh, soils in the peatlands, they, they can, uh, once they start smoldering, they can retain that combustion for really long periods of time. So as a result of, of various phenomena, you have the susceptibility to peat fires increasing uh, across the globe. And it's due to a couple of different factors. Uh, in the northern latitudes, think about your Arctic tundra, for example, you have global warming um, accelerating uh, the, the melting of permafrost and, uh, and drying. That's the main factor in the northern latitudes. Whereas uh, in the lower latitudes, closer to the tropics, um, that's where a lot of humans live. And as our, our human population expands, as our need for food increases, we are driving uh, the need for clearing for agriculture. People need places to live. Um, and then some peat fires historically, you know, throughout geologic history have occurred naturally too. But, but those are the factors that are kind of driving this, uh, this, this fire triangle of peatlands, if you will. So when we get those fires, we get that smoldering combustion. Um, we get that soil consumption. So you, you might hear me kind of switch back and forth smoldering soil consumption, um, it releases tremendous amounts of smoke. Lots of carbon, like I mentioned, gets released to the atmosphere. And there's some really difficult management trade-offs too. So one of the, the management difficulties is, okay, think about the soil in a peatland. It's, it lies underneath the weather. You know, once you, you get a couple centimeters below ground, the wind does not matter, the, the temperature does not matter. So once you initiate smoldering, you might have a peat soil profile that's a couple of meters deep. You can have combustion in a peatland that's going on a meter beneath the surface of the ground. So it doesn't matter if it's raining, it's snowing in some cases up top, uh, you can have a lot of things different going on uh, below ground. You can, you can have it smoldering underneath there. So this creates smoke day and night, you know, typically uh, in a lot of flaming combustion, the forest fires will tend to moderate in intensity and smoke production during the nighttime hours. Now, if, since I mentioned that, that's the time when you get smoke that, that accumulates on roadways. And because peat fires tend to produce that same amount of smoke during the nighttime as the day, they are just extra hazardous. But they also accumulate, um, because of those particulates in the air, they can accumulate fog particles too. So that's kind of another, another aspect as well. So you've got a, a public health issue, um, air quality, safety. 
difficulty of control of those peat fires once they get going. Oh, and the story gets bad in terms of the carbon release too, because if you think about, you know, if you've got uh, trees growing on a landscape, even if the entire trunk of the tree burns, you're kind of limited by the basal area of the forest. Like you can only burn 100% of the basal area of that forest, and then you're out of fuel. But the basal area, if you will, of a peat soil profile is it's like it's infinity, right? Because you've got the entire area, if it is peat and if it is dried out, you can have huge uh, areas, huge amounts of carbon being released to the atmosphere. Um, if that weren't bad enough, if you just have a, uh, a vegetation fire that burns um, understory fuels and not the entire tree, you might be burning up um, fuels that existed as atmospheric carbon before they became plants, maybe a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago. But if you're talking about peatlands, if you are burning down well into the soil profile, of, you know, maybe a meter deep, you might be burning off carbon that was the leaf of a tree that fell and got covered up and covered up and covered up. It could have been there for hundreds of years or longer. And so you might be burning really fairly old carbon, maybe even over a thousand years old since it, it was a you know, biomass and then uh, dropped off the tree and, and became part of the soil. So, so that's why we say that the, the peat fires can burn carbon that's 10 to 100 times older than flaming fires. And um, one way I like to describe the difference in the combustion process is uh, the, the smoldering fires are a lot less efficient. So if you think about combustion efficiency, um, it is like the difference between uh, lighting a match and lighting a cigarette. Um, I have that on this slide here. So uh, if we were in person, you know, I could get away with lighting a match uh, in, in our seminar room and certainly not smoking a cigarette. And part of that is, is we all recognize the public health hazards of the chemicals that are produced in, in this smoldering combustion form uh, that produces all of these, not just greenhouse gases, but volatile organic compounds, particulate matters, and these BRC and BC, that's brown carbon and black carbon. Um, so I'll go into that just a little bit. And, and this, this is all just kind of a story about uh, some of the atmospheric sides of, of what's going on here. So I'm, there will not be a quiz later. Um, you don't have to write down chemical formula. Uh, it's late in the afternoon anyway. So here's just an example of what you get from uh, smoldering combustion. So look over there on that table there. We'll, we'll talk more about the table on the right in a second. On the left there, you can look uh, at this graph, three different kinds of peat over there. Um, oops, uh, I see that ponderosa is misspelled as, as well as cheat grass. So cheat grass, Think of a very efficient combustion. You know, there's, there's a lot of oxygen that can get to the individual stems and, and leaves of cheap grass. If you've got tightly packed uh, Alaskan or Siberian or, or Florida uh, swamp peat, um, then oxygen can't easily get to all the sites of combustion. And so you've got a lot of interesting chemistry that happens. Lots of interesting chemical profiles that come out of, of those, uh, those fires there. Um, so I've already mentioned some of the, uh, you know, some of the implications here. We, we did look at some of the differences um, across biomes. So, so that, that study that I just showed was, um, was out of the interest in saying, all right, if you have a peat fire in, um, in Malaysian Borneo, for example, under similar conditions as one in um, Siberian peatlands, for example, could you actually get uh, different emissions based on maybe, you know, like the different vegetation that forms peat? So we look at some of those differences. Um, that gets a little bit into the atmospheric chemistry that I'll talk about. Um, but uh, we were interested in, in looking at that. Okay, so I've already mentioned a little bit about the climate aspects, um, you know, the old carbon, lots of carbon. So, in the climate effect, 
something that you, you think about when you, uh, especially when you consider smoke from abundant particulate producing combustion like smoldering are the particulate effects. And what you see here on the graph, um, not sure if my cursor is gonna show up, but I'm, I'm circling around this cloud that says aerosol indirect effects. So if you think about the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, for example, um, then you think about the solar radiation coming down through the atmosphere and essentially getting trapped once it bounces off the surface of the earth, it gets trapped by the CO2 and the CO, this long wave radiation trap. That's the greenhouse effect, right? You get a lot more subtle interactions with the particulates that are in the atmosphere. If you imagine a cloud of smoke, um, then you could have the sunlight bouncing off the top of that smoke plume. You could have the sunlight penetrating partially through that smoke plume. Maybe some of the long wave radiation only gets through it. And so it, it gets kind of complicated and you've got you've to figure out how bright is it? How dense is it? What are some of those aerosol optical effects? So um, we looked at some of that to give you a little bit of a shortcut in some of these studies. And let's see, let me just briefly take a, uh, take a, a, a quick trip through some of these slides here since I've already covered a couple of these. Yeah, so we, we looked at uh, Florida, Alaska, Siberia, and we burned some of these samples that we were able to accumulate in uh, this, this apparatus over here on the left. This is a, a combination to, to add to your uh, fire science vocabulary of a photoacoustic ethylometer and a nephilometer. So this is equipment that does a detailed look at the smoke. Um, I don't mind um, admitting that in my graduate training, I just kind of black boxed smoke. I didn't understand very much about it. I was more focused on the vegetation and the ecological effects. And I found myself in my, my previous job as a research professor interacting with a lot of uh, atmospheric chemists and atmospheric physicists. They focus on the smoke quite literally. And so we were able to use this equipment to do particle counts look at the sizes of particles even. So over here, and again, don't get too bogged down in the graphs, um, you can see in the upper left how we were able to look at the different distribution of particle sizes and numbers um, as they varied in this case uh, with moisture content. So this is very simply saying the smoke from drier peat fires is different from the smoke when the, the, the peat is wetter. Um, similarly, we looked at albedo, single scattering albedo, SSA is, is what it's called over here on the, the x-axis of this graph to the right. This is essentially, it is a function of the reflectance and the absorption of light as it passes through or gets reflected off of different colors of smoke. So this is essentially looking at the color of the particles at a molecular level. So kind of coming back a little bit to, okay, what did we find? Uh, why did we do all this? Because we were interested in saying, all right, what goes on with these peat fires at different parts of the globe when they occur, different peats from different ecosystems? And um, do they, you know, can, can we add anything to the uncertainty that exists about the, um, the, the ways that we put numbers on things like climate change models, on, on ecosystem energy balance models? So it uh, turns out we were able to, to track some changes as you change ecosystems, as you change combustion conditions. And one more thing that's important is the context. So if you look at the, the graph down here at the bottom, that's the albedo of the scene. I think it, um, that's on this slide. Maybe it's a different slide where I mention it. But essentially, if you imagine you could have smoke coming off of a, a peat fire and it could be traveling over uh, something that's really light colored 
like sand on a beach or even snow, for example. And so you'd have a scene where it's really light, or you could have that heat going over a dark forest or water, in which case uh, the implications of that radiative, uh, that, that, that uh, energy balance would, would be somewhat different. So um, you, let's see, I'm just trying not to get too much into the weeds here, but we were essentially able to, to take a look across these biomes and, and imagine, no, sorry, measure uh, some of the things that, that uh, these different types of peat smoke contribute to as far as the, uh, the net radiative forcing um, effects of, of the different peat fires. Also, uh, and this is, this is where I can change direction just a little bit because we've been talking a little bit about some of the atmospheric effects. Um, taking a detailed look at exactly what is in the, uh, the combustion products of these different fuels was a little bit of a new thing back in, in these days a few years ago. And so instead of just saying, okay, this type of combustion produces this much carbon dioxide and this much CO and lumping together so many other things, okay, these are just uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs. Um, we use some, some detailed chemical methods to actually say how much of each of these uh, 43 or so different chemicals were present. This is what we used to be able to do over here on the right is we used to just be able to kind of say, all right, those are organic acids or those are, you know, those kind of teal cover, colored things are just a bunch of anhydro sugars. But um, this new ability to, to take a high resolution chemical look allowed us to actually um, apply some of what we know about potential carcinogenicity. So this leads us in the direction of some public health research so that we can actually begin to uh, predict and understand the, the potential impact of peat fires when and where they occur on the local human populations that are having to breathe these in. Um, so this work kind of goes off again in, in a different direction, but this just gives an example of, of some of the fairly interesting points of departure you can, you can take and go in many different directions from when you start with something as, as kind of um, simple seeming as a smoldering lump of dirt. But back to that smoldering lump of dirt, um, kind of going back in time again, let's stand here and let's, let's think about some of the ecology of this because maybe we're not atmospheric scientists or chemists and, and maybe, uh, maybe we're, we're not uh, destined for a career in, in public health, but maybe we're ecologists, maybe we're, we're foresters and, and we're interested in what's gonna happen next. So I did spend some time thinking about what will happen when it rains here? What will happen when the vegetation grows? And I came up with, uh, I, well, I really came to a point of indecision. So bear with me while I take you on a tour of these little influence graphs that I made. Um, on the left, we can imagine that if you have a peat fire, um, that ash that you saw represents nutrient mobilization and at the same time, oops, you get a negative influence on soil surface elevation, right? So you decrease the soil surface elevation. So up here, this nutrient mobilization, that's increased. You increase the uh, leaf area index. Um, those plants will grow because they've basically just been fertilized. As soon as it rains, you have, you have uh, better soil uh, from a nutrient standpoint. Increasing evapotranspiration, maybe. This is all just a guess. Um, that, you know, produces some extra relative humidity right in that micro site. At the same time, you got more leaves, more vegetation. That's going to decrease your wind penetration right at that site uh, when you get grasses and maybe shrubs growing up there. That's also going to increase your humidity because more plants, more ET. Oh yeah, meanwhile, over here, the soil surface elevation is lower. Um, so that increases your soil moisture content. How do you know? Just, you know, just go dig a hole and, uh, you know, 
a foot or so down, you'll, you'll find the soil will be moister. So I reason that those things could have a negative feedback on future peat fires. But I thought, wait a minute, what about, you know, in the short term, you, you get uh, a peat fire, you get mortality and consumption of fuels. And uh, okay, that increases your wind penetration in the short term. Um, it exposes the soil surface to more insulation, more sun. So that's gonna increase your soil temperature right there. Uh, meanwhile, that increased wind penetration, that's gonna allow the wind to, to dry out that soil too. So that is gonna decrease your soil moisture content at the same time as this increased soil temperature over the years is also gonna decrease your soil moisture content. And that'll do the opposite thing from what you got on the left side. So that would increase your, your feedbacks to future peat fires. So, you know, I had stood there uh, enough next to that tree in that hole to, to really get myself confused. And so, now we become, now we come to the, the point where it's, it's really a story about uh, me going to some colleagues, friends of mine in grad school who know more about this stuff than I did, soil scientists and hydrologists. And I said, well, okay, help me, help me game this out. Um, and so uh, with those other co-authors that you saw in that paper, we just kind of played around with it. Um, for a few years, this started, uh, you know, my last year or so in graduate school and then uh, proceeded along for three or four years afterwards through lots of different jobs that people got and some kids that they had and, and, and things. But we said, let's test these hypotheses. So here you have this, this thick block of organic soil that I, I represent with my really cool PowerPoint drawing here. So as it smolders, it, it forms this little basin. Um, there's, your, uh, there's my representation of the basin underneath the tree there. So you, you get multiple of these basins that can form on this, uh, this peat landscape here. Um, here's kind of a, a, a wider landscape view. Ah, yes, aggregate basin volume. So, you, so this one over here has a volume, this one over here has a volume start adding them up because as you get several of these across the landscape, um, they really add up to be a significant potential sort of negative empty space, right? And combine that, remember me talking about a uh, wet and dry season in Florida and a lot of other places that, that host peatlands. So this is just a hydrograph. Uh, let's say that the gray line here in the middle is the soil surface. And so if you look down here at the x-axis in, in July, um, you might have a lot of rainfall, you might have a lot of water above the soil surface. And then beginning in January, you see it started to dry down because in the later parts of the year, you don't get as much rainfall. And so the, the water level drops way below the soil surface. Um, so I'm just going to take this hydrograph and represent that in the next few slides. Okay, so here we are back to the landscape-wide basin volume. There's our tree. Okay, this is nothing more than water um, on top of the landscape during the wet season. So this has a certain depth. This is an inundated landscape, right? Um, you don't have to get too complicated. This is just the water depth right here. It's a function of the precipitation and the specific yield. We don't have to become hydrologists there, but let's, let's just call that the landscape storage competence, how much water can sit on that landscape. Okay, all we've done here is we've decreased the water depth because now we've got these holes that have burned in the soil surface. So we've got that initial depth minus the um, accumulated volume just spread across the area of the landscape. So we're just going from deeper to less deep. So here again is, is a kind of a PowerPoint schematic representation of, of what that could look like. So becoming, you know, realizing that, that we're ecologists and we're interested in some of the implications, like uh, maybe you don't care too much about just how much water is flowing across the landscape. 
maybe you're interested in something more like wildlife habitat. Okay, this is where it gets interesting for me because walking around in the woods, I see that late in the dry season, when the landscape is all dried up, uh, these depressions are still there and they're hosting frogs, fish, crayfish, and other things that, that form high quality habitat. Um, if you don't recognize this bird, I know that you may not be you know, expert ornithologist, but this is an American wood stork right here. And uh, it just so happens that late in the dry season is also the breeding season. And so this, did you see it? I'm really, I'm, I'm gonna try and become an, an animator for Pixar in my next career. I hope this gets me there. But the habitat over there on the right may be higher quality because it contains, um, it contains some refugia for these prey animals that these endangered wood storks like. Not so much on the left, but thinking back to fire, what's the difference? The difference is that we had um, kind of a, a devastating drought season peat fire that had happened over here on the right, maybe a year or two before that. And the one over on the left uh, didn't burn. So that creates some interesting, uh, some interesting implications. Does that mean that uh, in some cases you might need uh, you might need a peat fire every now and then? Okay, so this this animation is going to take a second to get out of there. We are. Um, so to help me sort of figure my way out of this confusion, um, my friends, the co-authors that you see on the paper, and I developed this slightly more sophisticated influence diagram. And the story here is that this helped us to generate some hypotheses. So we don't have to go through the math. In fact, uh, I know that we don't have time to do that. But we just use this, this kind of fancier version of, okay, there's a fire that increases storage, increases hydro period, increases organic matter. And, and you can read uh, the description of it in the paper if you're interested. But to me, I think the more interesting thing uh, to talk about here is kind of looking at it, thinking about it, exploring it with its influence diagram led to our hypotheses here. And, uh, you know, we'd already done our dissertations. This kind of came out of uh, just conversations with colleagues or with, with friends that, that became scientific colleagues. And we decided to test these hypotheses with, with a bit of a model. So we set it up. Um, in a realistic place that, that we happened to know a little bit about. And this was this landscape that I'd shown you in Southern Florida. So we just looked at a few different places. We said, okay, how about a few different scenarios, uh, just kind of a Goldilocks type of scenario with a, um, a high and a low and a moderate amount of these depressional wetlands that could potentially become those basins across the landscape. So what do you do with a model? You parameterize it. Okay, so we put in some sort of reasonable seeming values in, and again, you can read more of the details, but uh, you know, a certain amount of rain, certain amount of rain volume. Okay, remember, you know, that's just three dimensional because we're looking at a block of the landscape here. A percentage of the wetlands that have burned, um, the uh, increase in the wetland depression depth, um, and so forth. And uh, oh yeah, we had to, those of you who have taken soil classes, hopefully most of you uh, had to think about soil porosity as well. So, so then we just explored a few different scenarios to see, okay, what, what could the implications mean for wetland fires in these um, little peatlands uh, in, in different scenarios, in different places. So here's uh, just sort of one um, photographic representation turning into a schematic representation. Uh, unburned to burned. Okay, what happened? The water table decreased and the hydro period increases. Let me actually repeat that in a different way. The hydro period increases locally to this particular spot. I'm going to go back a slide and then forward again. So here's this, here's this wetland here. If you're following me, and it's, I'm sorry, it's really hard to tell on, on Zoom, right? But here's the increase in the hydro period. Remember, hydro period is just the amount, the, the duration of time when this, this specific spot is underwater. But because you have this volume here that is taking up or it's accepting water, 
the water table decreases. So a local hydro period increase and a distal water table decline. So distally, you're actually drying things out. Um, so we go through a few different scenarios here. Um, and this, the, something that's kind of interesting that you could predict if, if you've been following along is the implications are different as you look at the different amounts of wetlands that could occur across the landscape. So again, here you have, watch the water table. I think the water table is gonna change here. Yeah, so the, the hydro period increases, the water table decreases. So you could actually have a case where um, you have a peat fire um, sort of digging a deeper hole that becomes storage um, locally. And it actually kind of pulls water into it, it becomes a literal sink. And then um, because there's a finite amount of water available on that landscape, you could actually cause it to kind of pull water away and, and dry out the surrounding landscape, making it potentially susceptible to future fires. So that's just kind of, to me, uh, an interesting story about feedbacks here. Um, so the next couple of slides just go through a few of the scenarios, but I, I do see here that we're coming up close on time. So I don't wanna belabor that point. This is really just about going through all the different conditions that you could imagine. And um, if you're interested in discussing that, we'll have plenty of time afterwards, uh, either for questions or, or to go into it. Um, but again, you know, it's, um, this I think is interesting because as a researcher, one of the secret powers, one of the special powers you have is convincing yourself that what you're doing is extremely important and extremely interesting so that you can finish that thesis or that dissertation or that manuscript, right? Um, so I think it's interesting, but I think the bigger thing that's, that's also fairly interesting to me is, is this is a process that uh, occurred in the context of me beginning in graduate school and kind of reaching out to some buddies who uh, were smart in areas that seemed useful, but uh, difficult for me. So they helped me out. We, we kind of came together, created some hypotheses and just turned it into to its own little research project together. Um, okay, so, so back, out of, back out of the clouds, um, there are some uh, implications for management. You know, the difficulty of control of peat fires and the negative effects does mean that by default, we, we just tend to have a de facto policy of suppression of peat fires. And that means that when we are suppressing or preventing any of these fires from occurring, we could be having some of the unintended consequences uh, like we explored in that paper. You, you could inhibit the formation or maintenance of things like potentially refugia for wildlife and uh, so that, that could have some unintended consequences for uh, wildlife habitat, uh, ecosystem services, and so on. I think we need to continue to exploring these, to continue to explore these because um, the treatment that, that I've just described was very uh, superficial in its scale and, and quality, to be honest. Um, but I think it points us in a direction of maybe we should be scratching our heads a little bit about this. Um, one, of the, one of the bottom line things that, that I mentioned when I have presented this type of topic before, there is a potential conservation benefit of ground fires in low relief landscapes. So if you really want to see me be very unpopular, imagine me at a conference suggesting to managers that maybe they want to start a ground fire a stinky, very difficult to put out, haze causing, air quality degrading ground fire in their areas. And uh, you can imagine what uh, kind of feedback comes from that. Um, I'm ready to fairly quickly speed through the next couple of things. Um, I've already mentioned that uh, there's, some under, there's some unknowns. Um, just one hazard, especially when you do any kind of fire research that, it, that involves lab, 
Um, there's a big disconnect between laboratory burns and field research. You probably know this, um, but I think future areas could include more, uh, more questions about some of the transition from smoldering um, or to smoldering from, from flaming combustion and how those peat fires really get going and maintained. Um, also, obviously, I think we're still uh, really in a, a fertile and productive area where uh, we're thinking about some of the ecological implications of peat fires, as well as some of the, the climate aspects and, and climate implications. Um, so with that, I think, uh, am I not too terribly far off my time, Connor? And um, if we do have, if, if it's the appropriate moment, I think this would be a good segue to see if anybody who's still awake has any questions. Yeah, we've got about 12 minutes. If folks want to have questions, you can either feel free to just unmute and ask your question, or you can type it into the chat and I will read it aloud. So I just want to point out quickly, Adam, thanks so much for coming to our seminar and in our audience today, I think there is a benefit of doing Zoom. Uh, there is a, our graduate from a few years ago joining today and she will be actually working in Leo with Pitland. So I just want Denny to say hello. That's fantastic. Um, Hi. Hello. Uh, pardon me. Let me let me see if I can recover my uh, my full Zoom panel here over on my screen so that I can see as many of you as possible. Um, now that I can see more names and faces, uh, who, who's uh, working on peatlands? Well, um, I haven't really working uh, in peatlands for research, but um, as part of my work in Leo Conference in Indonesia, uh, we have a new peatland research center in uh, Biosphere. So I let uh, Bukim know that, hey Bukim, uh, this is a cool thing that he uh, uh, let me know about this seminar. Thank you, Bukim. Hello, everyone. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for, for attending. Um, I, I hope that I didn't say too many things that were wrong and uh, it'd be fascinating to hear more about some of the, the experience that you have with it. And Yonsu, thank you for the connection. Yeah, uh, I, um, I came uh, maybe 15 minutes ago, so I didn't uh, watch the first couple of uh, slides, but it's all good. We will have a recording on the School of Forestry website if you do want to catch up on the first part that you missed. Yeah. Um, we do have a question from Jim in the chat. Uh, he asks, what might be the net effects of peatland burning? I've always thought about it as a major carbon release phenomenon, but could that be mitigated by the possible cooling effect of smoke particles or reduction in methane emissions? Well, that's really interesting. I, um, you know, I, I think if I give a if I, if I give as short an answer as possible, and then of course, uh, because I've had plenty of coffee today, I'm going to ramble a bit. I think the short answer is um, there is some some recent and current modeling work examining just that sort of question. We do have um, call it the carbon bomb, like some uh, researchers call it, just tremendous potential for releasing very large amounts of old carbon into the atmosphere in forms that uh, are um, climatically active. And that's the negative. You know, the, as you mentioned, the, the potential uh, mitigations are, okay, peatlands when they're not burning, yes. And, and when, they're, uh, it's when they're undergoing decomposition of the biomass that's entrained in them, they are uh, what the methane sources. And as y'all know, methane is a very strong uh, greenhouse gas, uh, lots of radiative forcing potential there. So is it, is it possible that these huge amounts of aerosols that are emitted in peat smoke reflect a lot of light and, and kind of balance that out? In the short term, 
Yeah. Um, some of the work that, that I've been involved in does indicate that you can have a net cooling locally, especially, um, hmm, let, me, let me reel that back because I, I don't remember quite, th there is a nuance related to uh, smoke transported above or below clouds, but basically, basically you can have um, a mitigation effect from the particulates reflecting sunlight back. Um, the, it, it's a little bit more iffy, um, the release of long lasting greenhouse gases like CO and CO2 versus the methane emissions. Um, I honestly don't know. I think uh, that's a neat question. Uh, if I'd been if I'd been more up on the literature, I might be able to tell you, but, but that'd be kind of a good, um, easy uh, lit review type of thing to do. But I think long-term, um, you know, these particulates, they stay in the atmosphere and have their radiative forcing effect only for kind of days to weeks. And then um, because they're particles, they, they fall out of the atmosphere. And so longer term, um, my strong suspicion is that those tons, tons and tons of carbon in the atmosphere as gases are gonna uh, have a net, I'll say a net negative effect, a net warming effect is, is probably better to say because if you start talking about positive and negative to people who deal with albedo, then you get tripped up really quickly. Great question though. I'm also scanning uh, through the list of, of people who are here. And uh, there was one name um, that if, if you were really paying close attention or if you were reading the paper, um, you'll see a citation of Michelle Mack. And um, just uh, if, if anybody has had a chance to take her course at NAU, I don't know what she teaches. I don't know what department she's in, but uh, I had her as a professor when I was a graduate student. And some of the things that I mentioned in this, uh, this uh, presentation today, I learned uh, when I was a student in one of her classes. In fact, when I mentioned burning this, the peat samples, um, she graciously provided me with some of the samples that I used in some of my later work. Um, so I would just like to kind of give an advertisement. Don't, if, if you go and bother her, don't blame me. But uh, I think she, uh, she's a real asset in terms of uh, climate research, uh, especially in northern peatlands. We've got a question from Carol in the chat asking, are there plants or plant seeds that are adapted to smoke or need to be subjected to smoke to germinate? Wow, what a neat question. Um, okay, the first part of the question, and sorry, I'm, uh, I'm not looking at the chat, but let me, uh, let me take a look at that. First part of the question, uh, plants that are adapted to smoke. Um, hmm, I think so. Uh, if you think about a smoke adapted plant, I might actually uh, defer to anybody here who may know more about that. I, I don't wanna put anybody on the spot, but um, I would, what I could say is maybe the second part of the question, need to be subjected to smoke to germinate. Um, there is um, kind of a remarkable body of, of work that's, I think, been developed just in the last few years on what effects that, um, if you could imagine something like a smoke tincture or a smoke tea has on microbes, and whether in some cases it can inhibit germination, and in some cases, um, I think it's been found to actually enhance germination of some species. I hate to give an it depends answer like that, but I'm not really too up on it. Um, is, does anybody else know the first part of that question there? Or has anybody read anything? Because I feel like that, that might have been covered by somebody uh, in, in uh, some of the more contemporary uh, literatures. Sorry to say um, that I, I don't know the answer to that question, but that is a really good one. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the chat now and I see, uh, James, your, your uh, question, why does cypress occur in depressions near Gainesville and on mounds further south? Okay, um, for that, let me see if I could just very briefly uh, go back up to 
um, my my slides here and see if I can um, see if I can share this. Um, okay, does anybody do y'all see that slide where I'm I'm showing the aerial photos now? Okay, this is James. This is what you're referring to as uh, the Cyprus uh, depressions versus mounds. Um, it's almost like I, I planted that question. Okay, no pun intended. So up here on the upper left side of, of, this, of this slide, you see a, a picture showing the side of, of one of what you call mounds. They actually call them domes, D-O-M-E-S, in Southern Florida. And the reason that they call them Cypress domes are that from the side, it looks kind of like a dome shape, but it's, it's counterintuitive. It's not what you're expecting. They're still occurring in depressions. But if you think about if you think about it for a second, that depression in the landscape, it's going to attract and hold water. It's going to attract and hold nutrients. And so it's going to create better growing conditions in the center of that depression as compared to the edges. So the trees actually grow faster. And what you're looking at might be trees that are all the same age, but the ones in the middle are just bigger. And so it's not that they grow on mounds, it's that the, it's that the canopy is mound shaped just because the trees in the center of them are taller. But if you were to cut the trees down and scrape it out or, or uh, take out the water, you'd see that it's a shallow bowl, just maybe only two or three meters deep. That's a really cool question there. Um, okay, so uh, I'm looking back and I'm uh, seeing, I have a colleague who's interested in this, but I believe it has been uh, more investigated in Australia. I'm, I'm not too up on um, Australian uh, peat fire research. I, I am a little bit familiar with some work that's been done in New Zealand. Um, I would like to know more about that as well. Um, Connor, I see, thanks for the, uh, the, the post seminar discussion. Oh, and uh, before I go on, Pete, to uh, to your question, um, Connor, could you could you just guide us? Do we need to transition to that other seminar room? Or are we good for here? What what should we do? If you want to, you can read and respond to Pete's comment in the chat, and then after that, we can move on. Take maybe a five or ten minute break to give you a chance to get some water or a snack, and then move over to the some post seminar discussion. Okay, um, so. Uh, I'm just gonna read uh, Pete's comment. There's a parallel between the deeper holes holding more water and the historical conversion of seasonal wetlands in Arizona to cattle tanks dug out to hold water year round. There's a habitat benefit, but a major loss to the natural hydrology and biodiversity. Um, I can just imagine that that has got to be a really interesting topic to research uh, if, if you're there in Flagstaff. Um, is that, uh, Pete and others, is, is that something that, that folks are working on? Because that, that seems like really interesting reading. Yeah, that's, a, that's an important area of <clears throat> research because practically every place that would hold water on a lot of our landscapes was converted to a cattle tank. And so they're uh, beaten down by hooves, the, the native, those were hot spots of biodiversity because the wetland plants would grow there and so on. Uh, Jim, for instance, and others. Uh, do a lot of this kind of research. Really neat. You know, just one of the um, one of the joys as uh, I have had the chance to look across ecosystems, and you all will will do this if you haven't already, is just appreciating um, some of the the ecological realities in one place versus another. So, so Pete, your comment about uh, the, the parallel between the, the water tanks on the landscape across Arizona and these uh, shallow depressions um, in, in a place as ecologically, climatically different as Florida yeah. um, is, is, is just fun to think about. Cool, well with that, I think we can wrap <laughs> things up. Yeah, my dog's going crazy. <laughs> It's the witching hour. Um, we can give a, a, a hearty thank you to Adam for presenting. Sorry. Um, and then, yeah, maybe reconvene at 510 for the post-seminar discussion.
Thank you so much, Adam. I just want to say thanks again. And uh, for anybody who, who uh, was generous enough with your time to, to attend this and pay attention, uh, but unable to, to come to the discussion, just thanks so much. I really appreciate it. See you all in about six or seven.